The following is a presentation of Chandler Christian Church in Chandler, Arizona. For more information, please go to chandlercc.org. Your copy of the story with you today. Raise it up, would you? Raise it up. Be great. Raise it up. Great. Keep those with you, bring them with you every week, and we're going to be talking about them, sharing together. And this week we're in chapter two. Let me see a show of hands. How many have read chapter two already? All right, super, super. We're sharing together in that. Last week we started off wonderfully, and uh, uh, I was not able to be here, but uh, yes, I have listened to the message, so I'm on target. We had about 1,100 people who committed to either be here or to listen to the message every week. That's phenomenal. Over 1,200 that have committed to read the chapter every week. So we're going to be growing uh, this next year as we share together in God's Word. And last week, uh, Pastor Matt shared with you, we learned that God created mankind to be in relationship with Him. That was God. God's desire, and he created Adam and Eve, and he made them special, set apart from the rest of creation. He gave them something. They didn't give all the rest of creation. What he gave them uh, was the spirit and the ability to choose. He gave them free will. He gave them a choice. That's different than all the rest of the animals, all the rest of all of creation. And he gave them that ability to choose, knowing that they would choose to serve self rather than him. God knew that if he gave mankind the choice, the choice of staying in relationship with him or the choice of doing what they wanted to do, that they would choose what to do what they wanted to do. And as a result of that, sin entered into the world. And because of that choice of Adam and Eve to choose to serve self rather than God, a sin uh, entered into the world and every descendant born to them, you and I, are born with a sin nature, that same ability to choose. And some have asked me, well, did God know this was going to happen? I mean, when God created mankind with that ability to choose, did he know that they were going to choose to turn their back? Did God know this would happen? And my answer is yes. But there's a reason for that. About 33 years ago now, Nancy and I decided that we wanted to have children. And uh, about uh, two years later, our daughter, Ashley, was born. Uh, And when we decided to have children, we decided to do so because we wanted to pour our love into someone. We wanted to share that joy of our love with someone else. And we wanted that love to come back to us again. But when we decided to have children, we also realized that we were taking a risk. The risk is when you have someone who's a full sentient being, able to make choice, that they can choose to embrace you in love or they can choose to eventually say, I hate you, I hate you, and leave your life and walk away. Some of you know that heartbreak. It's a choice. And we were willing to take that risk that we might pour our love into someone and hopefully receive that love back again. And God knew the risk. He even knew what would happen. But he knew the risk because you cannot freely love unless you freely give choice. And that's exactly what God did. And as a result of that choice, Adam and Eve chose to sin. And sin entered into the world. We all became born with a sin nature. And their son Cain killed his brother. And it started a down world spiral to the point where God was even sorry that he made mankind. In fact, uh, in your storybook on page 4, which is Genesis 6, 5, and 6, the Bible says, The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on on earth, in that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Sounds like our world today, doesn't it? And the Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So God decided to flush and start all over again. And he did that through Noah. He called Noah, who had grace in God's eyes. And uh, then Noah constructed the ark, and they had the worldwide flood. And as a result of that, uh, God gave a promise, the rainbow, that when we see that, we're promised that God will never destroy the earth in the same way with water again. But God started all over again with flood. And some would say, well, did a worldwide flood ever happen? I went to college. Come on, worldwide flood, did it ever happen? Well, I believe that it did, and I believe there's good, solid evidence for that. If you look at the evidence, um, and so I've given you on your outlines, there's some uh, places for you to go. Uh, www.creation.com, there's a web page you can go to find some good solid answers based on evidence and based on science. Another place, uh, the, the icr.org, where you can go and do the, the study, do the due diligence, and I think you'll agree with me, there's solid evidence for the flood. And we can learn from Noah. In fact, I found a place one day that said, all I ever needed to know, I learned from Noah. 
And I think it's good insight. In fact, this is what that person said. All I ever needed to know I learned from Noah. Number one, don't miss the boat. Good instruction. Good. <laughs> Number two, remember that we are all in the same boat. Number three, plan ahead. It wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. Number four, stay fit. When you're 600 years old, someone may ask you to do something really big. <laughs> Number five, don't listen to critics. Just get on with the job that needs to be done. Number six, build your future on high ground. Number seven, speed isn't everything. The snails were on board with the cheetahs. Good to know. Number eight, when you're stressed, just float for a while. Number nine, remember the ark was built by amateurs, the Titanic by professionals. <laughs> and number 10, no matter what the storm, when you are with God, there's always a rainbow waiting. Isn't that good? And that's God's promise to us. So God moved forward with this plan to rebuild that lost relationship with mankind. See, his plan was to build a new nation from which the Messiah or the Savior would come. God's plan was to build a new nation from which the Messiah or the Christ or the Savior would come. So he could bring mankind back into that lost relationship with him. When we chose to sin, we separated ourselves from God. God's plan has been from the very beginning to bring us back into that lost relationship. And God does want us back. Whether you have stayed away from him or strayed away from him, God will go to unimagined length to bring us back again. Whether you've stayed away or strayed away, God will go through unimaginable lengths to bring us back. And that is what this story is all about. God's plan to redeem us, to bring us back into that lost relationship with him. And he will go to unimagined lengths, even the sacrifice of his son, his only son, to show the length of his love and the height of his love and the depth of his love. He will do it to redeem us from our sin and bring us back into that lost relationship with him. So who is God going to choose to start this new nation? Who is God going to choose to begin this new foundation to bring us back again? And that is the subject of chapter 2 of the story. Uh, it's also Genesis chapter 12. And God chooses two people, Abram and Sarai. Abram means father. And Sarai means princess. Abram married a princess. We all married princesses, didn't we? Anyway, so he married a princess. And several years ago, uh, we had a guy that was doing our video on staff. And he put together, as he was leaving, he put together this little video on the life of Abraham. Now, we've never shown it here because it's wrong. But, but still, um, it's funny. So uh, enjoy it now, would you? Father Abraham had many sons, many sons. Uh, Dad, where are we going? Behold, six flags. This used to be a beautiful amusement park, but now they're turning it into a parking lot. That's not why I brought you here. You see, son, I've been talking to God. Okay, now you're talking freaky. What are you doing? I'm taking this tree branch, dipping it in water, and now I'm just gonna wave it around, just like this. Uh, that's weird. I've had about enough of your mocking me. I'm just going to take off my build just like this and then I'm going to flog me uh dad what are you doing now hold still for a minute I'm just gonna light the barbie here there we go I should have bought the cutco set eh but this stone knife will work okay uh, Dad, what are you doing with the knife? Abraham! What? What are you doing? I said a kid, not your kid. Look, there's one right there. Whoops. Um, son, not a word about this to your mother, boy. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord right on left. Now, if you read chapter 2, how many of you know that's wrong? That's just wrong. Yeah, but it is funny. 
So who's God going to choose? God's going to choose Abram. And, uh, and, uh, but why? I mean, why did he choose Abram and Sarai? I mean, think about it. They, they didn't have any, they had all the wrong qualifications to be the founder of a great nation. Uh, Abram and his family, all of his family worshiped pagan gods. They were from Ur of Chaldees. They didn't worship the one God. They worshiped pagan gods. Abram probably worshiped pagan gods too. So why did God choose him? And they didn't live in Canaan. They, lived, uh, they didn't live in the promised land. They lived in Ur of Chaldees and in the tigris Euphrates River Valley, 1,000 miles away. So why God to choose them? And Abraham was 75 years of age. Sarah was 65 when God chose them. They were old and they didn't have any children. In fact, Sarai was barren, unable to have children. So why would God choose them to build a great nation? And my answer is this. Because God loves to use ordinary people in extraordinary ways. God just loves to use ordinary people you'd never expect. God loves to choose to use ordinary people in extraordinary ways. I mean, Abram and Sarai were barren, able to have children, yet they were old. They were 65, 75 years of age. And yet God gave them a child, Isaac. And Isaac married Rebekah, but they weren't able to have children until finally she gave birth to twins. And one of those twins was Jacob. And Jacob uh, was a liar and a cheat and cheated his own brother out of his birthright. And yet God used him in marvelous ways. And Jacob had 12 sons and 11 of them sold the 12th one into slavery. And yet that one who was a slave in Egypt became second only to Pharaoh. And God used him in marvelous ways. God loves to use ex- ordinary people in extraordinary ways. He even takes a truck driver and a Pilates instructor and uses them to make a difference in Trujillo, Peru. God loves to use ordinary people in extraordinary ways. And we need to always remember that because God may choose you as well. And when God chose this couple, this ordinary couple, Abram and Sarai, he said, follow me and I'll show you a land whose builder and maker is God. And God then gave them four promises. It's found on page 13 of the story or Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. He gave them four promises and here are the promises. He says, first of all, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. Second promise, I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. Third promise, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And the fourth promise, all the peoples of the world will be blessed through you. So God called this guy out of paganism into the wrong land to go find this city whose builder and maker was God to a place he'd never been before, never seen before, and gave him this promise even though he was 75 and had no children. So what did Abraham do? He just trusted God. And he packed up the family, and like the Beverly Hillbillies, they took off towards that Hollywood, uh, for the promised land, because he just trusted God. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Well, uh, as you look on the map, um, uh, or by the way, from time to time in the story, God interjects some information, or the writers interject some information from the New Testament into the Old Testament passage so that we get a full picture. And here on the story, on page 14, they do that. They quote from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, and it, it says this, By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go to, uh, to a place he would later receive his inheritance, he obeyed and went, even though he didn't know where he was going. I mean, he had no idea where he was going. He just followed God. He just trusted God. And so they left on the map. uh, They left from uh, the Ur of Chaldees, which is in the Tigris and Euphrates River Valley, what we now know as uh, Iraq. And they traveled up what was called in history class uh, the Fertile Crescent. They went up the Tigris, Euphrates River Valley until they went to the city of Haran. And they were there uh, for a period of time. And then they left and came down that Fertile Crescent through Lebanon and Syria into what we now know as Israel or the Promised Land. And when they arrived there, God said, this is the land I'm going to give you. This is the Promised Land. You're here. But they didn't stay there because a horrible famine took place in the land. And Israel is primarily sourced by rainwater. And so if there was no rain, there was no sustenance. And so they took the family and moved down to Egypt because in Egypt was fertilized by the Nile River. It had water for irrigation so they could grow crops. And they lived for a while down in Egypt until finally they were brought back out of Egypt and into the Promised Land, and that's where they were settled. And when they came back into Canaan, or the Promised Land, God renewed his promise to Abraham. On page 14 of the story, Genesis chapter 13, the Bible says, The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had parted from him, Look around from where you are to the north, the south, the east, and the west. All the land that you see I will give you and your offspring forever. And I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth. But they didn't have any kids. 
so that anyone could count the dust, they could count your offspring, but they didn't have any kids. Still no children. Now they were trying, I have no question that they were trying, but no children. And you know they were praying, God, you promised. Oh, God, please fulfill your promise. And they prayed and they tried, but there were still no children. Even though God had made the promise, there was no answer to the promise. And during this period of time, if you read the story, you know that Lot was taken captive from the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham went out and captured him. And they, they were taken captive by a group of kings. By the way, those kings show up in archaeological evidence of that period, that time. Kind of interesting. And, and then uh, they were brought back. And on his way back, he ran into this guy by the name of Melchizedek, who was a priest of the Lord God. And when he ran into him, Abram gave him a tithe or a tenth portion of all that he had. This is way before the Old Testament law, which teaches tithing. Now we see tithing taught pre-law. This has always been God's plan for giving and always God's plan for blessing. Just what we taught in the ABCs of financial freedom. And so Abram gave Melchizedek a tithe. But he was still frustrated because God was not answering this promise. God was not doing what God said he was going to do. And in his frustration, he cries out to God, and God says, listen, just trust me. Just trust me. On page 15 of the story, which is Genesis chapter 15, verses 5 and 6, the Bible says that God took Abram outside, and he said, look up at the heavens and count the stars, if you can indeed count them. And then he said to him, so shall y'all your offspring be. And Abraham, what's the next word? He what? He believed the Lord, and God credited it to him, as righteousness. And God said, look, you're going to have children, as many as the stars in the sky. And Abram just said, okay, God, I trust you. Even though I don't see it, even though I don't have it, I just trust you. And there was still no baby. So now at uh, 98 and 88, Sarah's beginning to think, well, maybe God has different plans. And she tried to take God's promise into her own hands we do that a lot don't we where we're waiting for God to do something we're waiting for God's time we're thinking well maybe God needs a little nudge here maybe God needs me to help him along the way and and, and Sarai uh, thought maybe God promised Abram he was going to have a child but maybe I'm not to be the mother of that child and so one day she went to Abram and she said Abram um, maybe I'm not to be the mother of the baby maybe it's somebody else I've got this young good-looking Egyptian handmaid her name is Hagar and I was thinking, maybe if you would want to have a physical relationship with her, that she could bear you this son that God promised. And she took God's plan into her own hands. And Abram said, Sarah, and he said, no, go ahead. If you want to have sexual relationship with Hagar, it's okay with me. And Abram said, okay. And, uh, <clears throat> and he agreed. And there was no argument in the Bible whatsoever. Abram said, okay, that's what you want. And, and he did. And they conceived a child. And that child's name was Ishmael. But because Abram and Sarah took God's plan in their own hands, they messed it up. They messed it up. Ishmael was Abraham's son, and, and it was a son of promise, and so God had to fulfill the promise. But it wasn't the promise that God wanted. God wanted the child to be born of Abram and Sarai, not Abram and Hagar. But because he was a son of promise, God said, I'm going to make him into a great nation too. But he's not the one through whom the fulfillment of the promise will be made. And so Ishmael became the father of the Arab nations. And he prescribed that, that the son Ishmael would be a wild donkey of a young man at odds and at warfare with everyone on earth. Does that sound like a fulfilled prophecy today? And, and how about the relationship between the seed of Abraham, Israel, and the seed of Abraham, Ishmael, or the Arab nations? Any conflicts going on there today? See, folks, when we try to take God's plan in our own hands, we usually end up messing it up. Now, get amen to that? We usually do. And that's exactly what happened here. And we're still suffering now 4,000 years later from that plan. So now Abraham, or Abram, is 99 and Sarah is 89. And it's been 24 years since God gave him that first promise. I'm going to send you in a city and I'm going to, to make the whole world blessed through you. 24 years since God's call and God's promise and still no baby. 
And God appeared to Abraham to give him some reassurance. And he said to him, Abram, i am tell you what, you just keep being faithful and trust me because the promise is going to come true in my time, in my way, in my plan. Just keep trusting me. And just to remind you of how much that promise is going to be true and to reward you because of your faithfulness, I'm going to change your name. Abram means father. Abraham means father of many. And Sarai means princess. Sarah means queen. Queen. Now, you have to think that they might have thought, God, this is a cruel joke. I mean, you promised me that we're going to have children, but we have no children. You promised 24 years ago that my descendants would be as many as the dust of the ground of the stars of the sky and that there's no baby. And now you're changing my name to Abraham, father of many. That's cruel. That's cruel. But they still trusted. And one day, Abraham and Sarah were out in front of their nomadic tent And Abraham saw three strangers come across the countryside. And whether he knew they were from God or not, we don't know. But he treated them with a nomadic hospitality. He offered them tea, he offered them cakes to eat. And Sarah, as a woman, was not allowed to be in their presence. And so she hid outside the tent, but was listening. Had a cup and was listening. I don't know. But she was listening outside the tent flap. And Abraham was talking to these guys. And when they got up to leave... uh, one of the men said to Abram, Abraham, uh, we're going to come back next year for a visit. And when we do, you and Sarah are going to have a baby boy. And Sarah laughed. She just laughed. And uh, I, when I, Nancy and I were talking about this, Nancy said, well, it was either laugh or cry. I mean, she's 89 years of age. Come on, <laughs> you know. But she, she just didn't believe it was possible. I mean, it's impossible. She's 89 years of age. Come on, get real. And the angel overheard her laughter. And in Genesis chapter 18, verse 14, the angel said, Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Now, I told you as you read through the story, you're going to see pictures of Jesus all over the pages. And and let me remind you of another girl, not elderly, but young, who one day was visited by an angel who said, you're going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. And that young girl said to the angel, it's impossible. I've never known a man. And the angel said to her, nothing is impossible with God. You remember her name? What was it? Mary, yeah. And here we begin to see the fulfillment of God's upper story fulfilled in the lower story. God's plan of redemption. And so 25 years, finally, after the very first promise, 25 years of waiting and journeying and questioning and frustration, but 25 years of faithfulness to God, God kept his promise. Folks, listen, God always keeps his promises. He always keeps his promises. No matter what they are, no matter where they are, no matter how long it takes for him to fulfill them, God always keeps his promises. He he promised that he will never leave you, he'll never forsake you. He promised that if you'll keep the word, he'll bring success into your life. He promised that he will will be with us till the end of the age. He promised that if I'm going to go to the Father, I'm going to come back and take you to be with me also. And when God makes a promise, God always keeps his promises. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says this. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Faith is not receiving it. Faith is trusting God when you don't have it. And Abraham just trusted God. Even though he had no children, even though he didn't understand the land, he just trusted God. And when it comes to God's promises, it's not just the receiving that gives us the reward. It's the faith. It's the journey of trusting God even when it doesn't make sense. Well, the Bible is full of promises to us. And maybe you haven't received your promise yet. Maybe what God has promised you has not come to you yet. Just be faithful. Just be patient. Because God always keeps his promises. Amen? He always keeps his promises. Well, then a few years later, when Isaac is now 15 years of age, Abraham's 115 or so, God calls of um, Isaac, um, or God calls of Abraham something amazing. Isaac, when he was born, you know, his name means laughter. Isn't that cool? 
And, uh, and so when Abraham was 115, Isaac was 15 years of age. Um, God speaks to Abraham again. And for every parent in here, you know that God asked him to do the impossible. The Bible says in uh, Genesis chapter 22 or page 19 on this story. Then God said, take your son, your only son. Underline that, would you? Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac. And go to the region of Moriah, circle that, the region of Moriah, and sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I will show you. Now you may say, whoa, whoa, this is like way out of character for God. Okay, but you have to understand that in the culture in which Abraham lived, the pagan gods that were worshipped by the nations around them, human sacrifice was a normal process. Typically, the firstborn son or the firstborn animal was given as a burnt offering to the gods. And so although this is foreign to the God of Abraham, it's not foreign at all to the people in whom Abraham lived. And so when this call was made to him, I'm sure that Abraham didn't understand. And I'm sure he questioned God. And I'm sure he thought, well, God, you promised me 25 years ago that my, through, my, through me and my descendants that we would occupy this land and that all the nations of the world would be blessed and that my descendants would be as many as the sands of the seashore, the stars of the sky. And now you're asking me to sacrifice my son, my one and only son? So what did this man of faith do? Well, on page 19, Genesis chapter 22, verses 3 and 4, the Bible says early the next morning. It just amazes me. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded up his donkey. And he took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. And when he'd cut enough wood for the burnt offerings, he set out for the place that God had told him about. And on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place at the distance. And he said to his servants, you guys wait here. Isaac and I have a destiny to fulfill. And Isaac and Abraham and the donkey and the wood went up to the top of one of the hills in the region of Moriah. And there Abraham prepared the stone altar and laid the wood and the coals of fire that they had brought with him were ready. And Isaac looked around and fear started to think, come into his heart. And on page 19 and 20 of the story, Genesis 22, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham answered, read with me, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Underline that. God himself will provide the lamb for the offering. So Abraham wrapped his son and picked him up, his one and only son, and he placed him on the altar. And taking the knife, as typical fashion, he would have cut his throat and bled the offering out as he set it on fire. And as he raised his knife to his son, his one and only son, God spoke. And God said, do not lay a hand on the boy. Don't do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. And Abraham looked up. And there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. And he went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. On page 20, we have another interjection from the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, chapter 11, verses 17 through 19. And the Hebrew writer adds, By faith Abraham, when, tested, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promise, who had faith in the promise, was about to sacrifice his one and only son. 
Even though God had said, it's through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, that all the world will be blessed. And Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. His one and only son. Now folks, when, when God makes a promise, God always keeps his promises. He always does. And God promised Abraham that if he would be faithful, that God will make you into a great nation. Did he do that? Absolutely, the nation of Israel. God said, if you'll be faithful, I will make your name great. Is Abraham's name great? You bet. 4,000 years now, we're still talking about him. God said, if you'll be faithful, I will bless those who bless you. Has he done that? Over and over again. And we'd be well to remember he will also curse those who curse them. And then God promised that all the peoples of the world would be blessed through you. And that one Abraham struggled with. Because to kill his own son meant that that promise would not be fulfilled. And God provided a way. In fact, interestingly enough, in Genesis chapter 22, verse 14, the Bible says, So Abraham called that place, the region of Moriah, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Some of you know this, some of you don't. This can blow you away. The region of Moriah is a region of seven hilltops. And 1,400 years later, a descendant of Abraham named David and his descendant Solomon determined to build a temple to honor the God of Abraham. And there on one of those hilltops, they chose the location in the region of Moriah to build that temple and to build the altar of sacrifice. You've seen it today in pictures of Jerusalem. When you see the Golden Dome, that's where the Muslim mosque is. But that's the location of one of the hills of Moriah. And that's where the temple was. But some 2,080 years after Abraham, another descendant of Abraham. The boy of Mary, the son of God, carried after being heinously beaten across through the streets of Jerusalem. And on another one of the hills in the region of Moriah, God took his son his only son and sacrificed him for me. The same place. And there you see the intersection of the upper story of God's plan to bring us back into relationship with him. Intersecting with the lower story, the story of Abraham so that we might bring those together and make them our story. 4,000 years later. You see, the Lord will provide, Abraham called it. And indeed, God kept that promise that all the peoples on the earth would be blessed through him. Abraham was just an ordinary guy, like you and I, called by God's grace. And maybe you think, well, God could never use me like him. Come on. I mean, you know, Abraham, but I could never. Oh, don't, don't mock him. Abraham reminds us that God loves to use ordinary people to do extraordinary things. But we have to trust him. We have to live by faith and never give up. Never take matters into our own hands. Just be patient because God always keeps his promises. And if we will let God use us in extraordinary ways, 
and live in patient faith, knowing that God will keep his promises. Listen to this. Then his story will become our story. And that's God's desire for us. So maybe today you suddenly realize that through Abraham, God provided for you. And that today, God's call for your life is to accept his sacrifice because the Lord will provide the lamb, his very own son, his one and only son. And if you've never given your heart to God's provision, Jesus Christ, we invite you to do so today. Immediately after the service, there'll be people down here in front, or you can go out to the welcome table, or, or, or just right on the back of your welcome card, I'm ready to accept Christ today. I'm going to be in touch with you, because this is the most important plan. This is the story, God bringing back into relationship with him, mankind. And today, maybe you can see your lives as part of his story, because that is God's plan from the very beginning of time. So what will your decision be? Well, that's your decision. What will you decide today? Will you pray?